Welcome everyone. We are back with Office Hours with Lisa Wang, which is a bi-weekly series of AMA style virtual office hours. These live sessions are co-hosted by Alice, which is a free website helping business owners start and grow their companies, and Woman Made, a PepsiCo initiative to support female founders with peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, access to tools, relevant content, and expert guidance. For support in your business, and to access the recording after this session, join the free Woman Made community at helloalice.com. Lisa Wang, our host for these office hours, is the founder and CEO of SheWorks. And this week, Lisa is joined by Marin Bannon, the co-founder and managing partner at Jane VC, to talk all about the power of networking and building relationships. At any time during the session, please feel free to drop your questions in using the Q&A function you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Lisa, would you like to take us away? Sure. Welcome everyone to today's live Female Founders Office Hours. Again, my name is Lisa Wang and uh, I'm so excited to have everyone here who is part of the community at Woman Made. I'm here today with Marin Bannon and she's a partner at Jane VC. And we'll be discussing today the power of networking and building relationships. So especially if you are just starting your business or you're starting your fundraise, it's really important to understand how to network and build those right relationships with investors early on. Uh, so who's excited for today? And if you could just put in the chat where your name, your business, and where you're from. Um, I would love to just see where you're coming from. Uh, I already see Barbara, um, founder of High Heel Hero, which just launched on iFundWomen. Awesome. Uh, Barbara, I think you were here last time. We've got David here. We've got Judy Baker um, from Sonoma, California, book marketing mentor. We've got Alicia from HippoWare, Roanoke, Virginia. David's from Vancouver. Um, Barbara is a native of Manhattan in Sag Harbor. Let's see, Adria, CEO and founder of Job Swiper near Seattle. Um, awesome to see all of you guys here and from all over the country. Um, so uh, before we get started, just want to say a quick thank you to PepsiCo for making these office hours possible and Alice. And as you hear interesting quotes or valuable nuggets of information, I encourage you to just write it down and engage with us on social. Um, and as we go through the conversation, as always, as questions pop up for you that you want to ask Marin, um, just type them in and we will get to all of your questions. So without further ado, Marin Thomas Bannon is the co-founder and managing partner at Jane VC. She is an engineer turned operator and entrepreneur who has built tech businesses for the last 15 years. And previously she was the CEO and co-founder of Little Lane, um, and her experience also includes leadership roles at a health tech startup, as well as leading consumer marketing for a billion dollar product at GenTech. And she's also a contributor at Forbes, an advisor at Parachute, and a mentor of Stanford StartX. So Marin, I want to turn it over to you to just um, tell us a little bit more about yourself, about Jane VC, and what gets you most excited about the female founded companies that you've worked with. Sure. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I uh, co-founded Jane VC um, a little over a year ago, and it was really based on my experience working in tech for the past 15 years and, and seeing just the really broad range of people building businesses and, and types of ideas um, and people, you know, in different geographies throughout the world uh, with a lot of ambition and a lot of ideas that maybe don't look like the traditional VC business in the Bay Area. Um, so uh, to me, I, I saw this opportunity in investing in a really broad range of types of founders um, and, and really saw a lot of in my network that were undercapitalized but still building these really big, compelling businesses. So to me, that felt like a great investment opportunity. Um, and so co-founded Jane. Um, a little over a year ago, and we invest in pre-seed and seed stage female-led startups. Um, we are focused on highly scalable tech businesses, uh, mostly B2B businesses, and we invest in the U.S. and Europe. Awesome. Um, so in terms of Jane, one of the reasons that I was excited to have you um, 
one thing. David, um, just let us know if you can see uh, and hear Marin's video. Um, and if you have any troubles, just let us know. Um, so in terms of Jane VC, um, one of the unique things that it launched with was the ability for founders who you know, didn't know you guys directly, didn't have a warm intro to be able to pitch you. What was the thought process behind that? Yeah, so um, I think that was really born out of the observation that, you know, VC is a very network driven business. And I think historically, um, venture has only been, you've really only been able to access venture if you have a certain type of profile, um, you've been to certain types of schools or have a certain network. Um, and if you don't tick those boxes, it's much harder to read a, reach a venture capitalist, a lot of know and really place a lot of value on that. So I think, um, it makes a lot of sense, I think, for a venture capitalists to do that because it helps them kind of easily screen through a lot of deals and figure out which ones they're interested in. But I think the downside of it is they're missing on a whole set of opportunities that are from people who might have enormous ambition and great ideas, but just don't have that. When we launched Jane, one of the things we really wanted to do is, is have a different type of ethos for our fund. And that's really about radical transparency and access. So we said, we're scrapping the warm intro. Anyone can cold pitch us. Here's how you do it. We have a form on our site that entrepreneurs can fill out, give us their basic information, and then we can assess whether they fit our investment focus so that we can get back to them um, with either a decision to dig into it or letting them know that it's that we uh, which be very kind of straightforward with that process so that it, it is meant with founder's time. Great. And how has that process been for you? How many uh, applications do you get on a daily basis and how do you sort through it all? Yeah, so we've gotten about 1,500 pitches since we launched. So in about a year, we've gotten about 1,500 pitches. Um, so it's a, it's a very high volume. And we, as I said, we have people fill out a form that gives the basic information, like type of business that they're building, what the stage is, what the focus is, um, so that we can just quickly assess whether they fit our focus, which is highly scalable tech businesses, mostly B2B, um, and at the pre-seed and seed stage. Um, and then for the ones that we are interested in, we try to set the bar fairly low to have a first meeting and we'll do the first meetings as 30 minute phone calls um, just so that we can meet a lot of founders and give a lot of people a chance to pitch us and then we try to set the bar quite high for the second meeting um, so the ones that we actually dig in and do a lot of diligence on um, you know there, there's only as a fund with two people we can't dig into every company so we try to really pick the ones that we think are the closest to our focus to spend that time really diligencing and digging in. Hmm. And, and then the other thing, um, oh, sorry, the other thing just to mention, um, for the companies that we don't invest in, we are trying to give a lot more resources about, so for example, if a, if a consumer brand were to pitch us, it doesn't fit our investment focus, it may be an incredible business, it's just not what we promised our investors we would invest in. So we're trying to get better about, you know, giving a lot of resources to those founders. So right now we'll send them a list of other investors that um, that might be a good fit. And that's something we're continually trying to evolve so that we can be a resource. Great. And what really stands out to you um, in some of those applications that would make you, you know, look twice? Yeah, so this sounds really simple, but I think it's actually quite hard to ha be able to describe your business in just a few words. And I think a lot of businesses that I see um, that pitch us, it takes a while to figure out exactly what they're doing. And I think um, a lot of that is just about storytelling and the communication. And it's, it's really the elevator pitch and being able to, you know, if you are in an elevator with someone and have five seconds, can you just get that idea across? And I would really push founders to figure out what that core thing that you do is that is unique and make sure that that just comes kind of screaming through in all of your materials so that it's something that people can't miss. Because if you have to dig through a really long email and it's dense and it's a lot of words and it's long sentences, sometimes it's, it's very hard to figure out what a business does, despite the fact that somebody obviously put a lot of effort into the materials and the descriptions and all of that. And 
as somebody who has a lot of experience in marketing, I recognize that this is actually a really hard thing to do well. Um, and I would say it's, it's going to be a constant process and constant evolution of trying to continually think of the, the way to describe your business in a really short, compelling way that make, makes people understand what you do. Yeah. Um, I, I always see that word, um, the ability to speak about what your company actually does um, is, is actually uniquely hard for an early stage founder when they're still pivoting and, or iterating or trying to find product market fit. Um, what mistakes do you see founders making um, in that initial pitch to you? Yeah, definitely. The other thing I would say is avoid the jargon as much as possible. And there's every business has a lot of industry jargon. And I think sometimes the descriptions have so much jargon in them that it's hard to kind of cut through it and understand kind of in plain language what really makes this business distinct. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific examples of um, perhaps a company that did that or what might be a bad one? Yeah, well, I think every company now is AI enabled or an AI for, for this or an AI for that. And there's always, um, you know, NLP and ML and kind of all these buzzwords that I think investors talk a lot about and are interested in. But I think um, probably what makes your business unique isn't AI specifically. It's probably some really specific customer need that you're solving and trying to get to the core of really what makes just state makes your pitch a lot more powerful. Mm -hmm. Got it. And one question that founders uh, often get, obviously, as they're fundraising is the valuation of the company. And I get this question a lot from women in particular around, you know, how do I, how do I value my company when, let's say, we're pre-launch or pre-revenue? Um, and so when asked, why is your company worth this much? What kinds of answers do you get and what kinds of answers really do resonate with you? Yeah, that's a good question. At the earliest, it's really hard to look at. Um, um, oh, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so at the early stage, it's really hard to look at business metrics and value a company. You know, a lot of these companies are a team and an idea and maybe a few customers and a little bit of tech bill, but it's hard to put those pieces together and say that means 4 million or that means 2 million. Um, and so I think probably the best way to do it is to look at comps and look at businesses that are in your market that are similar to you. Um, and you can look at, you know, different types of funding rounds. And I think probably the comps is the best way to do it. And a lot of that isn't, the easiest information to find, but it's talking to investors and talking with other founders just about what is market right now. And I think that the market will shift, um, you know, quarter by quarter even. And it, it is also a very local thing. So if you're in San Francisco, you're going to have a really different valuation than if you're in other parts of the world. Um, and so also knowing your local market, especially if you're raising from local investors and what what that market will bear. Mm, got it. Um, so I wanted to continue on through the Jane process um, and a founder has now applied. They've you know, had their 30 minute call. Walk us through what a founder could expect um, from that call, who they'd be speaking to and um, what you're really looking for. Yeah, so in that first 30 minute call, we try to ask a fairly standard set of questions. And I think if you look at, um, if you look at, there's some studies on venture and the questions that get asked. And I think women and men tend to get a, a different set of questions. And I think uh, women tend to get questions that are more about the risks and the competition, whereas um, male founders tend to get a lot more questions about, you know, what's the, the revenue potential or what's the market size of this business. So it's sort of, um, we've tried to be very thoughtful about asking a standard set of questions and making sure that those questions are about potential and really pushing people to think about if everything goes right versus what are the 8,000 things that could go wrong with an early stage startup. Um, so those first meetings, usually it's really about 
who the team is and what their bigger vision is and what the, the problem is that they're trying to solve. That's pretty much the theme of that first meeting. Um, typically it's me or my co-founder. We have a few other team members that sometimes step in and help us typically either me or my co-founder and then our criteria and it's something that we want to dig into we'll go and do a bunch of our own diligence on that company in that space um, and then we will have a second meeting with the founder that's usually an hour often in person with either me or my co-founder um, and we try to make a decision after those two meetings just to be very protective of founder time but we do a lot of diligence behind the scenes just talking with um with other people, um, we ideally like to talk to customers if the company has customers and we like to do a lot of reference checking because at the early stage, it's really you're investing in the team more than anything else. Um, and there often aren't, you know, long, long-term financials or a lot of data on the company, but it's more a bet on the space and the team. Got it. Um, and can you tell us a bit about your operator network? Sure. So um, we built our operator network because I think one of the things that we have noticed, if you look at, um, if you look at big tech companies, about a third of the employees are women. Um, if you look at top MBA programs, it's, you know, a third to even up to around 40% women. Um, so there are a lot of these, you know, talented women um, in these roles where you think, they could go and start companies, yet right now, 2% of funding is actually going to women. So there's this big disconnect, I think, in terms of the potential and what's actually going to women. So one of the things we wanted to do is really build this scene and this, this ecosystem around women founders. Um, and part of that is our operator network. Um, part of that are founder workshops that we do monthly to get early stage founders together in person to, um, to help give them a lot of kind of unique, um, unique uh, kind of expert advice on different themes. Um, but our belief is that, you know, you really need to make venture feel like venture is accessible for this group and create that network and that community that can really help support these founders as they think about starting businesses and as they quit their jobs and go off and do it. And as they start to build. And I think being an early stage founder is a very challenging and solitary job. I think everyone in your life will probably think you're crazy if you quit your well-paying job and go and start a business um, that is essentially an idea and nothing else. And it's um, a hard journey. And so I think the more you can have a group of people around to support you, um, other founders, people who are operators who can jump in and give you guidance and mentorship, um, I think makes a big difference. Definitely. Um... For the founders here, and um, as we're chatting, please feel free to share your questions in the chat um, about anything we talk about um, or about your own fundraising process. Um, but for some of those founders who you know, are first time founders and perhaps not in a you know, well-connected network of investors and other entrepreneurs, um, what do you typically recommend in terms of taking the first step? Yeah, in terms of taking the first step to start a business? To, well, to, to raise, raise funding. To raise funding, yeah. To raise funding. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I think that there's um, over the last, you know, five to 10 years, an increasing amount of information online about tech startups and about building startups and also about the fundraising process. So I think that kind of democratization of information is really powerful in making a lot more founders able to get this information they need to start businesses. So I would say go and read, listen to those podcasts and try to get a lot of kind of upskill yourself so that you have a lot of the knowledge about what venture capitalists are looking for, what a pitch looks like, what a fundraising process looks like. And then the second thing I would say is just talk to as many people as possible. And this is often not the most comfortable experience because it's not talking to your best friends about it, but it's finding people who are maybe a couple degrees of separation away from you, but maybe are in the tech world, are founders, are investors, but tap into your network, tap into anyone that you can who might be able to make an introduction or give you some advice. That process of finding those people who might have insight and help. Um, so those are, I think, the initial things 
that I would do. I think there are more and more, you know, online communities and meetups. There's things like Alpha, which is a community for women in tech. Um, there's Fem Street, which is a great newsletter, and they have a Slack channel that um, I think some of those groups can be really great ways to meet other leaders and in and just build that community yourself even um, and then I think when it comes time to actually to actually fundraise um, it's really coming up with who your target list of investors are and trying to get as many kind of warm connections to them as possible which is of course a time-consuming process definitely um, yeah so that, that's great advice in terms of getting started and um, once, so once they kind of get into the flow of it, another question that I commonly get is how do they maintain relationships after that initial meeting or initial uh, interaction? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's definitely time consuming. Um, I think some of the, the social networks out there can be really effective ways to do that. So things like um, using WhatsApp or using LinkedIn and some of these channels where you can kind of loosely keep updated and stay in touch with people that you may not be interacting with day to day. Um, I think uh, joining some of those kind of networks like Slack channels and networks for, for, um, for women in tech can be great. Um, I, I've seen some founders and investors have a regular monthly or quarterly update email that they'll send to people in their network. Um, and I think sometimes those are effective. I think you need to be whole about putting out there and make a group of people to read. Yeah, I think I think another thing that you could do is sort of come up with your short list of people that you want to make sure that you stay in touch with and just, you know, being really diligent about kind of checking in with people. And I think the in in person connection is really valuable. So anytime you can go to events and things like that and have a bunch of in-person connections with people, that can be a really um, effective way to do it. Got it. Um, and for the companies that you've worked with, can you just tell us some um, about some of the companies that are in your portfolio, um, what you're excited about uh, and what made you want to invest in them? Sure. So one of the companies we've invested in is called Vault Platform. And Vault Platform is a misconduct reporting uh, platform that is sold to companies, to corporates. Um, so it's everything from fraud um, to harassment, um, kind of anything that can damage the culture of that company. Um, and so I was really excited about this company because I think it, it solves, I think, what I saw as a big problem within corporates in terms of kind of getting those bad apples out before they start to really damage that company's culture. Um, but I also, um, I also like the idea that with this app, um, it's an app that's provided to the employees at the company so they can actually, um, you know, report things that they see, whether it's fraud or harassment or whatever it is, but then there's a button where they can choose to go together. So meaning I would only report this if I knew that I had a group of others that I was reporting it with. Um, and I think that gives people the security to know they're not going to be the one person who's maybe damaging their career by, by calling something out. Um, so to me, it felt like it was a clear, um, solving a clear business need. Um, it was replacing a lot of these outdated call hotlines that frankly, I think nobody actually wants to call. Um, and, um, and also just a really great way to actually make the workplace a better and more inclusive place um, and met the founder and I think um, just really was inspired by her passion for the problem she was solving and just how kind of dynamic um, and impressive she was and I think a lot of early stage investing is really just um, betting on a person so a lot of it was about her. Awesome. Um, we have a question from Barbara and she says lately I've been saying a million times that if there was the kind of help and collaboration around for women when I started online book selling in 1989. Um, uh, I helped a tech company raise 140 million. I have a hard time doing it for myself. I went through the prep for this today and my question is about crowdfunding slash equity crowdfunding. Is it okay to go to more than one platform? Um, so I guess this is, first and foremost, I would love um, your thoughts on equity crowdfunding as a VC. Um, what you think about that for an early stage founder? 
Yeah, so equity crowdfunding, um, it, they're often used for consumer products um, and it's not my area of expertise. Um, I, I haven't personally done any of the crowdfunding platforms or have much familiarity with them. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better response to that question. And I'm assuming because Barbara has um, put her company up on iFundWomen, which is awesome. Um, so if, uh, I guess to, to try and clarify Barbara's question too, in terms of going in, um, if you see a company who has raised some money from equity crowdfunding, um, do you think any differently about them in terms of looking at their cap table versus getting investment from an institutional VC? Yeah, um, I don't see a ton of companies that have done crowdfunding just because they tend to be more consumer focused. Um, I don't think it's a negative at all. I think it's a very viable go to market for especially a company where you have to buy a bunch of inventory and you want to actually, you know, do the crowdfunding campaign so that you can fund some of that. So I don't think it's a negative thing at all. I just think you need to probably think about the right type of business for that type of funding. And, and then the other piece of it is just making sure that I think the thing investors care about is making sure that you're not selling too much of your company too early. Mm, definitely. Um, I have another question from David, um, uh, which is really around, okay, so he has a friend, Kathy, who has a company who is fundraising. Um, the question is, what would you suggest so far as going faster? And I'm assuming, David, you mean raising money faster and closing faster? Um, if, if Marin, that question makes sense for you and um, you would like to answer it. Yeah, is the question what can help you raise funding faster? Yeah, I think it's a rally around closing. Um, and David, you can correct me if, if I'm interpreting you differently. Okay. Well, I think if that's if that's the question, um, I think the important thing with actually raising and closing quickly is to think of your fundraise as a process and say, you know, for the next four weeks, I'm going to be out fundraising. And that often means that most of your other business won't get done. And I think that's a really hard thing to do as an early stage startup. You have to kind of let a bunch of other things go. But if it's for a short burst, then it can work. I think if it's for four months or six months, it obviously doesn't. So I would say try to do fundraising in a short burst. Try to um, do a lot of pre-work. And you can do a lot of the pre-work more gradually over a longer period of time. But a lot of that is getting your pitch deck together, getting your intro emails, getting your list of target investors, getting kind of all the warm intros that you need. And then once you have all that information in place, you want to really stack those investor meetings in the shortest period of time possible um, so that you can go out to market, meet a bunch of investors, quickly get feedback, quickly try to find the one that is a good fit, and then get back to hopefully raise your funding and get back to building your business so it's not as disruptive. Uh, what sort of timeline do you think founders should really plan for? Yeah, I think if you do a lot of good pre-work for a fundraise, um, you, maybe you would do pre-work over even, you know, three, four months. And um, a lot of it is having your story really tight. You know, you probably during that phase would want to get a lot of feedback from investors and maybe even feedback from other founders on how to improve your pitch, how to improve your story, what would make it more compelling, and then getting a really good target list. I think if you spend a few months doing that and get that to be really tight, then I think you could make the fundraising process ideally make it, you know, four to six weeks where you're really actively out pitching. Um, obviously, that's a hard thing to do, and it's rare to see a founder at the early stage really do that well, because it's, it's not easy to, um, to do everything in that way. But it does, it is a way to fundraise where you tend to have a lot more momentum. Um, and fundraising is really a momentum game. And I think it's a negative signal when you sort of go out and talk to a few investors and then stop for a few weeks and then talk to investors and then stop for a few weeks. And it sort of, it sort of indicates that you're not serious about your fundraise or you're sort of dabbling in it. And I think that can backfire. Yeah, um, I think that's a really important point about the required focus that you need to fundraise. And unfortunately, it does take you away from operating and building your business. Um, but the, as you said, the faster founders can do that, the better. Um, so they can actually go back to doing that. Um, so we have a question from Yishin. 
um, Ishwan, sorry, and she says, I'm curious if Jane VC invests in consumer marketplaces, and if so, what traction slash key metrics do you look for? Yeah, we're not specifically focused on consumer marketplaces. We mostly invest in B2B businesses. Um, so I don't have um, metrics off the top of my head. Um, I would say, I think for, um, for consumer business, I mean, for any early stage business, a lot of it is about um, showing that you're solving a really clear problem in the market and that you have, you know, a, a really valid solution. And I think even if the number of users is really small, um, showing those kind of early signs of really high engagement and excitement about your, prod your, your product is, is really valuable. And then I think anytime you have a marketplace, I think it's also just thinking of the two sides of the marketplace and which side you need to, to see first, which side is going to be the more challenging side of the marketplace and just making sure that you're building that in a really thoughtful way because um, it's marketplaces are obviously not easy to get started, but once you can, can be really powerful. Yeah. Um, and um, Ishwan, I also actually wrote an article about this a few years back um, and really the difference in terms of metrics for B2B SaaS companies versus consumer. Um, and I will put it here uh, for you. Um, so next question is Alicia. Once you have a VC interested, what is the time frame from the time the VC says yes to the time that you have that seed to start hiring or is there a lot of time with lawyers? Um, so Alicia, I, from your question is assuming that you have closed the fund, uh, sorry, closed your fundraise, when should you start hiring or when should you, you should start looking for um, new employees? Yeah, so once you close the funding, so um, now a lot of, oops, sorry. Am I still here? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so a lot of early stage funding rounds are now done on um, convertible notes and safes. So it does make that process of actually raising the funding a lot faster versus a price round, which there's a lot more. Sorry about that. I just lost you for a sec. Um, but in terms of like when to start hiring. So if you are in the process of raising funding and you have term sheets and all of that, um, and then, you know, of course, once it hits your bank account, if you wait until then to start hiring, I mean, it can take a few months to find that right person. And that's kind of essentially a lost few months where you're looking. So I would say the more you can kind of start to tee up people ahead of time, um, tapping into your network, figuring out the profiles of people you're going to need to hire, um, maybe identifying those people, maybe bringing them on in a contract type, type of capacity where you're sort of testing them out part time at a lower cost so that once that funding hits your bank account, you can really ramp up the team faster, I think is, uh, is a really positive thing in terms of not wasting time and time is so valuable for an early stage startup. Definitely. Um, cool. Uh, Alicia, hopefully that answered your question. Let us know if there was more that you wanted um, covered from there. Uh, okay. Heather says crowdfunding is not a good option for pre-product early stage startups such as mine. And most of the angels I've been introduced to are tech focused. Can you tell me how to reach investors interested in CPG ventures? Yeah, um, how to reach CPG investors. Um, so I would say just it's, it's all about research. So I would go into sites like Crunchbase, have a lot of different venture investors and a lot of startups. And it's really doing the research to figure out what are the investors who have invested in other consumer businesses, who have invested in other consumer brands, you know, find do that research and it's definitely it takes some time, but there are more and more blog posts on this too, where you can find lists of um, top investors for digital health or top investors for consumer. Um, but you really, uh, I think that's probably one of the most time consuming, consuming parts of the fundraise is doing that research to figure out who the best target list is. 
And, uh, and then I think talking with people, talking with other founders, you often get some of the best insights just based on kind of quick conversations with other people on, you know, who do you think might be interested in, in my business? Um, so I would say it's a lot of uh, research behind the scenes to find the best ones. Yeah, and I would, I would echo that also. It's um, kind of the more work up front that you can do to um, figure out exactly who's right for you. Um, and some of that stuff is also looking at um, funds that have invested in your industry or companies that are similar but not competitive. Um, of course, there are generalist funds, but I always think that funds that um, if you have something uh, unique in a particular industry and they have a focus on that, that means those investors can also bring uh, more focused value um, as opposed to generalist, but it all depends on what you're building. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. We have another question from Marie Berry. And she says, I'm running an enterprise SaaS platform and I'm two months into the fundraising process in touch with 24 VCs so far. And after some iterating of my deck and pitch, I do get a lot of intros and meetings and in a couple cases gone through early due diligence process. And I do have some early commitment, but I don't have a lead yet. So her question is, do you have any tips for finding a lead? Um, I.e. messaging needs to be stronger that we are actively looking for a lead. Um, and then I'll get to your second question. So why don't we tackle that question first? Okay, and what's the stage of the business? How much is she trying to raise? Uh, Marie, if you can let us know how much you are currently trying to raise um, for your marketing tech SaaS platform, let us know. Um, let's see. Um, Roxana says same, same, oh, Marie says two to 2.5 million. Roxana says same boat, 250K left of 750K. So it's seed stage. Okay, seed stage. So I think if it's, um, if it's around like the 751, um, you don't necessarily need a seed for that, or sorry, need a lead for that type of round. You could gather together some small funds and some angel investors. You could set the terms yourself. You could use a note or a safe. Um, for a two to two and a half million round, I think you typically would need a lead. Um, and so that I think is often the hardest part of the fundraise is finding that lead investor. And I think once you get the lead, you often get a bunch of other people to pile on. Um, so I guess one thing you can do is you can go out and get those kind of soft commitments from the smaller checks and the angels just um, that can help in terms of just having that base of investors ready to go once you get the lead. Um, and then I would say um, it sounds like you've had conversations with a number of funds. So I would kind of think back to what's making them say no or what's making them kind of pause and diligence and try to figure out like what what the issues are and try to figure out how to fix them um, before having more conversations and that's one side of it. I mean your pitch could be amazing though and it's all great and so I think um, just making sure that you have a big enough top of funnel funnel of, of investors that you have kind of in your pipeline is also the other important side of it. And so I think it's a combination of kind of sensing whether your pitch is resonating or if there are things you need to fix, as well as making sure that your pipeline is robust enough so that you have enough, um, enough potential funds in there. And then also the other thing I would say is really prioritize the funds that can lead because you can waste a lot of time talking with smaller funds and angels who might give you commitments, but can't actually lead. Um, so really find those ones that do lead and focus all of your energy on them. Awesome. Um, Marie, hopefully that answered your, que your first question. And then, um, so your second question, the most common reasons are that we are pre-revenue and thus no real indication of revenue and retention rates. How would you recommend going about this? Should I look into pre-seed funds rather than seed funds? Um, luckily, we just closed TikTok as our first paying customer. So hopefully that will excite investors. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, if it's a two to two and a half million round, it's harder to go to pre-seed funds. Um, m- maybe some of them, but I think that is more in like the seed kind of camp. Um, if you're pre-revenue, I don't think that that necessarily is a barrier to raising a seed round, but I think it is all about having your story be really compelling and having your business feel like it's really unique and really kind of an end of one business that um, you have an opportunity in front of you that, you know, is huge and, and telling that story really effectively to the VCs. So I don't think it's necessarily an issue not to have customers. I think you, you do need to have validation that you have some semblance of product market fit at the seed stage. You definitely don't need to have full product market fit, but you need to be showing that you are getting feedback from customers. You're solving a real problem. You're doing something that they care about. Um, and kind of those early, I would call them like early glimmers of product market fit are really important um, at that stage, even if you don't have it fully. Awesome. Um, So I think on a a slightly different route, Selena wanted to ask about bootstrapping. And she says, I'm currently bootstrapping and trying to decide if I should continue to go this route or attempt to raise. Is it better to raise after you've hit certain revenue milestones or raise the money so you can hire and then grow faster? My company is a prop tech SaaS venture. I lost you for just a second. Can you repeat that question? It was about bootstrapping. Yeah. So she said she's trying to decide if she should continue bootstrapping or attempt to raise. Um, And is it better to raise after you've hit certain revenue milestones or raise money so you can hire and grow faster? And Selena's company is a prop tech SaaS venture. Okay. Thank you. So I think if you can bootstrap, Um, you maintain all of the control over your business and over your destiny, frankly. So I think um, if you're able to bootstrap, that's amazing. And I would do that for as long as you can. Um, I think the reason to raise venture is if you see something really working and it feels like you kind of want to pour fuel onto something. Um, And I think that's the right point to raise venture. And I think the other thing is once you raise venture, you're going to be on this kind of cycle where you're going to be much more trying to exit for your business. So it can't necessarily be a great return for venture capitalists. Um, and so I think once you get into the cycle of raising venture capital, you often need to keep raising and then find an exit for your business. So it's a very different type of journey and trajectory um, and one that you'll have a lot less control of. Yeah. Um, So Maren, um, seems like you cut off slightly in the middle when you were saying um, the moment you take venture, you, um, so you're bootstrap as long as you can, if you can do it, but the moment you take venture, you're kind of going down um, and then you kind of cut out there. Yeah, so I was saying um, bootstrap for as long as you can. As soon as you start taking venture, you get into a cycle where you need to often continue taking venture, continue growing at really high rates and eventually finding an exit for your business. So you lose a lot of that control that you have when you're bootstrapping a business and you're much more, when you raise venture, you're much more forced to exit. So um, I would say like really think hard about what your ambition is and what you want to get out of this business. Is it something that you want to, own and control and grow into a big business, that's great. You might be able to do that through bootstrapping. And there are a lot of examples of businesses that have done that. I don't think raising venture capital is necessarily the best for every business. And it's not raising venture capitalists isn't a success, I think, building a a big business is. So um, there's just so much, you know, media out there about fundraises, and it feels like that's overly celebrated um, in today's world, instead of actually building something meaningful, which I think there should be more celebration of. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that as well. Um, I definitely think that the, the media narrative around success being how much you can raise as fast as you can raise, um, shouldn't actually be the marker of success. And it is, um, it definitely changes the tone of your business when you do raise. Um, and I would say there's certainly a lot more pressure to grow a certain way. Um, 
let's see. So Selena's question we've answered. And now we have Shriya Prakash. And she says, I'm the co-founder of Flexi Bees, where we create and source flexible roles and projects for experienced women returning to work after a career break with a primary market in India. We have been around for two years and have product market fit, paying clients, and are now looking to scale with much more tech integration. While the demand end of the business is pretty robust and we're solving a clear problem for business, our journey still starts with our vision for helping the underserved. Um, that's always how we start our pitches. My question is, is that going to hurt our chances with VCs because we have impact at our core? Yeah, that's a good question. And it um, obviously it's going to depend who you're talking to, because I think some VCs are much more focused on impact and many aren't. Um, so know who you're talking to. Um, and then even with an impact investor, I think you want to phrase it as building a, a big sustainable business um, and solving problems that customers have. Um, and I think having that added story that you're also doing something that is meaningful and doing building something that matters is really powerful. But I would probably lead more with the strength of the business you're building versus the impact side of it. Because um, if you lead too much with the impact side of it, it can come across as sounding like a nonprofit, which it sounds like your business absolutely isn't. Um, but yeah, just I think a lot of it is just knowing who you're talking to. Yeah, um, I would agree. I think I tend to find um, female founders, I, we all have impact at our core. Um, you know, we're, I think in 2019, going in 2020, if you're building a business that isn't actually creating positive change in the world, it's like, why are you creating the business at all? That's my personal opinion. But um, yeah, I definitely think to speak the language of high growth VC investors, um, I would also echo uh, leading with not the impact. Um, all right, answer live. Let's see, um, I have another question from Alicia. She says, what is the percentage of diversity that you look for at Jane? Currently we have four women and two men, but we have several uh, on our sales side that are men. HIPAAware is an insure tech SaaS platform. Yeah, so level of diversity we look at. So we look for, we call it female-led. And what we mean by that is at least one female founder. Um, so a lot of the businesses we invest in have um, a mixed team, men and women founders, um, which is absolutely fine. We have some companies we've invested in with um, one female founder or with two female founders, but it doesn't need to be the whole team. Um, I think it just is our focus is at least one female founder. Um, and we don't have other and diversity requirements Sorry, go ahead. What are your thoughts on uh, solo founders? That is a good question. I think um, I'm not opposed to investing in solo founders. Um, we are, yeah, we're absolutely open to it. I'm trying to think to our portfolio. I think we have two solo founders in our portfolio, maybe a couple more. Um, I do think being a founder is a really, really hard journey and doing it completely by yourself and having nobody to go to through those ups and downs. Um, and obviously you have, you know, your friends and family and support network, but I think having a great co-founder can just be really, really powerful in terms of having someone to go through the ups and downs with and, and also having the complementary skill sets. Um, that being said, if you don't have somebody who is, you know, the obvious founder for you to go to, I don't think it's worth forcing it. Um, I think that the founding relationship is sort of like marriage, you know, you're really in it for the long haul with someone. And I think if you look at a lot of startups, there are a lot of founder breakups, there are a lot of founder messiness. And so if, if you're going to add a co-founder, you want to make sure that it's somebody who really clicks with you and has the same values and makes sense and spend the time up front getting to know that person and making sure that that is true. Um, I think some investors, I think will be nervous if there isn't a co-founder, but I think a lot of investors are, are fine with it. I would say it's better to go at it alone than pick a co-founder that you don't feel like is the right fit. Um, 
It's um, it's a tough well, question, though. Once, well, it's an interesting stat that two thirds of startups um, fail as a result of co-founder breakups, which is right after running out of money. And it's, uh, I think, I always like the marriage um, metaphor because it's almost like when I've heard people who just find a co-founder because they hear it's easier to get funding with a co-founder. And I always equate that to kind of like getting married because you're supposed to um, and society gives you pressure. Mm -hmm. but I don't think it's not necessarily a um, formula for long-term success. Um, in terms of just looking forward, Marin, what are some of the things like trends that you're excited for uh, that Jane is uh, excited for? Yeah, so um, I think there's a lot more um, focus and attention on the diversity issue in tech. And I think the past couple of years has been this huge acceleration of interest in it, which I think is really positive in terms of getting it on more people's radars. Um, so I'm excited about the trend of hopefully people putting more money where their mouths are and actually backing more diverse founders. And hopefully, I think it'll take a long time, but hopefully the, the ecosystem ends up um, more interesting and um, more diverse. And um, hopefully we end up building a lot bigger range of businesses that help a much bigger range of people. So I'm excited about that. Um, and we'll keep working on it and see what we can do to, to help the cause at Jane. Awesome. Um, and I do know that there's, of course, a lot of people in this chat and in this office hours from all over the world. And Marin, you're in Amsterdam. And tell us where your mm -hmm. partner is and um, what you look for in even geographical location. Are you any, are there any specifics there? Yeah, so I live in Amsterdam and my co-founder is in Boston. Um, so I do have, uh, I do have a preference for startups that are for me either in Amsterdam or London or that vicinity, just so that I can actually be closer to the startup and meet them in person and help them and add more value. Um, and my co-founder, the same goes for her in Boston and New York. She really likes to be able to have startups that are more local to her that she can help. Um, that being said, we're open to investing in startups throughout Europe and the U S and we have a pretty geographically distributed portfolio. Um, and so we're, we're fairly opportunistic. Um, and we both spend a lot of time on the West Coast and have a bunch of investments out there. So I think, um, you know, open to a bunch of different geographies, but it's always nice when you can meet somebody in person and have that, that connection with them. Definitely. Um, so I think we're gonna take this one last question from Selena. She says, how do you view non-technical founders who haven't worked in the industry they're disrupting? I have advisors on my team who have deep industry knowledge, but that wasn't my background. Yeah, good question. I think if you're a non-technical founder um, jumping in and trying to build something, I think having advisors, I think um, finding, finding that support, I think a co-founder is really valuable that type of situation if you can pull in a technical co-founder just because um, your your cycle and learning time will be a lot faster if you have that person by your side um, and you can kind of build and iterate quickly together versus having it outsourced and having to manage an outsourced team and having just those cycles be a lot slower. Um, so I, I see tons of really successful founders who aren't technical, but I think it's finding the way to get those resources, um, whether it's advisors or co-founders or even just, you know, employees, CTOs and things like that, who can um, add that expertise to your team. Yeah, and I always say when it comes to the type of company you're starting or the industry, um, whether you have deep industry expertise or just really, really, really passionate about that industry, I think um, those things are key. Um, versus starting a company because it's hot and on trend and there's a big market. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that that sometimes happens where we just, um, I've seen founders who do it because they feel like they should be doing it. Or people have said there's a big market for it. Um, and I think that that never kind of comes across in terms of passion if you aren't truly passionate about what you're building and what industry you're in. Um, and I with, definitely agree. And oh, keep going. <laughs> 
I was just going to say, it's a lot of work and a lot of, you know, long days and long nights. Um, so if you're not really passionate about it, it won't be easy to stick with for the long run. Cool. Um, and just with our couple minutes that we have left, uh, just some parting words of wisdom, um, actionable advice for the founders as they're going into the end of the year and planning ahead for their new year. Yeah, actionable advice. Um, I would say, you know, balance, take care of your mental health, take some time to rest and recharge um, at the end of the year. I think it's really important. And I think there's, you know, this mentality of work, 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 and it's hard to turn off, but try to force yourself to do it because I think you'll be refreshed and more productive um, in the coming year. Um, I think that's, <laughs> that's my piece of advice at this point in December <laughs> um, and I will, I will also echo that in terms of just um, self-care and uh, going into that founders. Um, I'm going to do a little, uh, I just sent out to um, a link to iTunes for a new podcast that you guys can all listen to. It's called the Global League of Women podcast. We talk about burnout and fundraising and entrepreneurship. Um, so that would be good for binge listening. But thank you so much, Marin. This was a really uh, insightful conversation. Thank you. It was great. We're turn Thanks it over everyone. to Team Alice. Yeah, thank you both so much, Marin and Lisa. This was super insightful. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. The recording from this session and all these great resources that both our panelists and y'all have been sharing in the chat will also be made available in the Woman Made Community on Alice. Um, and there's a link in the chat box over there if you want to go check that out right now. Um, but yeah, thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Marin. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, and we will see you guys soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.